Excellent. Well, welcome, uh, everyone, uh, to our, our webinar um, on laying the foundations uh, for generative AI and our data strategies. Now, I can't see the whole room, so I'm trusting that you're there. And this is a classic thing with a webinar where you're talking to a void. So I'll, uh, I'll do my best to have confidence uh, that, the, that the people are out there. So, um, yeah, welcome. I'm Peter Chamberlain. I lead the public sector technology practice here at ScotLogic. Um, for those less familiar with ScotLogic as a company, uh, we're a, a UK-based consultancy with over 500 full-time uh, employees. Um, we tackle complex business critical problems for some of the world's largest institutions, particularly in uh, finance and in the public sector. Um, we do that by designing and building bespoke technical solutions and services. So we're a lot of technologists and designers, data people. Uh, as a company, we have a strong commitment to people in the environment. That's our own people and the world uh, at large. And as part of that commitment, we have become a certified B Corporation. So um, we take those steps to, to build our, our values into the way that we work and the company that we are. Uh, I'm joined today by two data leaders uh, to discuss generative AI and how we can lay the foundations uh, in our data strategy now to meet the opportunities and address the challenges of this emerging technology. And uh, we've, we've all heard a lot about AI this year. I think it's fair to say um, it's been the story of 2023 in tech, uh, and it's the word of the year in various dictionaries, press releases, as I'm sure we've seen in, in the papers recently. Uh, we've probably all played with one or other of the tools uh, available uh, for generative AI by now, whether it was to compose text or create images uh, or access knowledge uh, up until the cutoff point of 2021, if it's ChatGPT. Um, uh, these are things um, we simply couldn't do. Uh, certainly not at any scale with any sort of consumer interface uh, only a year ago. As I said, it's likely it was ChatGPT that you've that you've used or perhaps Dolly or uh, or one of the other uh, image generators. ChatGPT has gone from zero to hundreds of millions of uh, monthly users in just a year, which is just an extraordinary scale up um, for what might be a party trick in some people's eyes, but it's certainly got something there. Uh, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, has described AI as being more profound than fire or electricity in terms of its impact on the world, um, which is certainly a, a bold view. A more conservative view from Bill Gates uh, is that artificial intelligence is as revolutionary as mobile phones or the internet. But either way you look at it, people think it's a big deal. Um, and it's possibly the biggest hype any of us have seen in our careers just in terms of the scale of expectation and conversation about this technology. And it is worth saying that Gates and Pichai are both people with a vested interest in this tech. They run companies uh, or founded companies that the that, that, that big corporations that lead the development of these tools. But industry and experts have widely embraced the technology as a reality. We can see that there's something in it. And the tools right now are impressive and they're evolving fast. So there are things to improve with these tools. There are things that we uh, don't know about them, that we need to operationalize or, or learn. But we do know that this works as a technology. So how do we respond? For many of us working in technical leadership roles, AI is top of the list of considerations for our strategy right now, certainly in terms of the kinds of things our colleagues uh, in maybe less technical uh, fields are asking us for or about. Uh, and as a consultancy, uh, Scott Logic, we're obviously having a lot of conversations with our clients about the impact of this and how we can help harness these technologies and tackle the issues uh, surrounding them, perhaps. Um, but we need to navigate the now and the next. We need to take action in the real world actually now, pragmatically to embrace the opportunities and to mitigate the associated risks. We need to be forward thinking about how we bring these technologies into our organizations um, and thoughtful and mindful of the, of the consequences, side effects, and really where these technologies are in terms of their operational maturity. Uh, in this hour, we're going to look at generative AI through the lens of data strategy. Um, how will generative AI transform our work as data professionals? And what should we be doing or thinking about now and next um, to take advantage of it and address those risks? So a bit of housekeeping before we go into the conversation, I'll introduce our guests. Um, you should all have access to the chat. Uh, and as we go along, if you have questions, please ask them in the chat. Just pop, a, pop the questions in there. And what we'll do is uh, either pick them up as we go 
um, or perhaps come back to them at the end, uh, depending really how they fit into the flow of, of the conversation. Um, so don't worry if we don't immediately pick the question up and we do pick someone else's up. We'll try our best to, to get to everyone's points um, as we go along. So I'm joined by two uh, data leaders working predominantly in the public sector, but with a breadth of experience, Charles Baird and Dr. Jasmine Grimsley. Charles is the chief data architect at the Office for National Statistics in the UK here. His mission is to enhance data in the ONS and across government by making it more findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, uh, as well as better linked. And in that role, he's responsible for things like the integrated data service, which supports research from cross government data. It's a very large scale uh, project for the UK government. Prior to that role, uh, Charles was head of data architecture and the chief digital and data office, which is central in the government and the cabinet office, uh, leading the data architecture strategy standards uh, for data in government in the UK. And prior to that, uh, Charles had a long career in industry and joined the civil service in 2020. Dr. Jasmine Grimsley is co-founder and chief data officer of London Data Company. The company's strong principal vision is to help to create an equitable, informed planet guided by intelligence from data. LDCO applies this mission across both the public and private sectors in data analysis, science and engineering. Her background is as a data scientist and she was previously head of science and research for environmental monitoring for health protection at what became the UK Health Security Agency, previously the Joint Biosecurity Centre, where she was uh, played a significant role in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the UK. Uh, Jazz is also an adjunct professor at Northeast Ohio Medical University, where as a real doctor, uh, she talks to those uh, fake medical doctors uh, about data and, and, and healthcare as a specialist. So welcome both. Um, and apologies for me joking about uh, the the reality of, uh, of doctors versus uh, medical doctors. Um, uh, shall I start with a question to you, Charles? Um, the AI industry is going into build mode. Okay, the, the, we there are so many startups now, and of course the big corporations incorporating these tools and building all this tooling in uh, for AI. Um, what kind of um, uh, how do you see your team rather using AI tooling? in the near future? What are the things that you're seeing your team picking up and what kind of impact do you think that's going to have? Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, good question. I think, um, and I mean, I should say from the outset that ONS aren't using Gen AI in any production environments. It's just important to get that disclaimer out there early on. Um, you can see, you see how so seriously ONS takes data security for the fact I can't access Zoom on my work laptop, so hence why I'm on my phone right now. Uh, but the um, there is a lot of interest, obviously, from the business in terms of what could we use it for. And I think we're in we're quite an interesting possibility space where, as you say, lots of hype going on and lots of push from the business about you know uh, people within the business. Not just as a scientist, could this replace analysis in general? You feed some data and you train an element on your on your corpus, and you get you know, the ability to just ask questions of your data. Um, given that I'm a data professional, I've got obviously a vested interest in the answer to that being no. Uh, I don't think, and I don't think we are uh, anywhere close to that yet. Not least because we're still in the the age of generalist um, generalist LLMs. We're still in the age where it, it is prohibitively expensive to train new ones on your on your model. I don't have the infrastructure of it and i've got fairly substantial data infrastructure uh here the 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 so the the push is often to get to a what big new exciting things can we do with this how can we kind of revolution what we re revolutionize what we're doing given that i'm a data architect by by training i and inclination if you like my my instinct is to start using this more in terms of professional tooling so Lots of the work of a data architect is quite manual. Lots of the work inc includes quite a lot of subject matter expertise. So if we're talking about schema extraction or modeling or metadata management for specialist data sets, then these are things that are quite labor intensive. And some of the work we're doing here and with colleagues across government is to start to test, can you use the generalist LLM? Can you use ChatGPT to start to do some of that? I'm not going to call it scut work because it is obviously very highly skilled and thing, but you know, for highly skilled architects, that's scut work. How do you get this stuff out? So it will 
hopefully enable my teams to start thinking about think the things we've always wanted to be thinking about. How do you structure data better? How do you manage data better so that you can feed these things in the future and get better answers out of them? So what I'm hoping is that we can take this in a, a two-step approach. One is to get some value as a kind of force multiplier to, to, to professionals right now. But then on the back of that, be able to make significant improvements to the data, which will then hopefully get us into a virtual cycle with this stuff. My big fear, as I think I said to you when we originally talked about this, is that is that the hype cycle bursts before we're able to start getting the benefits from this, because there are definite benefits to using it. And we are seeing quite impressive results, even just from generalist uh, LLMs. But, but yeah, the, 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 the worry from my perspective is that interest moves to the next thing before we've had time to get into that virtuous so, so let's put some some sort of specifics on the bones there. So let's say you've got a you've got a, a team of data architects who are um, developing uh, metadata management uh, tooling. Um, you're creating uh, schemata for different kinds of um, data sharing across government. Um, are you talking about the kind of tooling that would support them to um, to automate some of the the things that they currently have to do manually? What what sort of specific things would you be thinking about? Uh, there. So, in terms of specifics, the um, there's obviously a lot of a lot of modern tooling for pulling out the structure of data sets and starting to, to to help model them. What the value add from a the value add of a data architect, if you like, is the ability to to understand those. You know, as much as we can pull out structures, as as much as we can pull out um, metadata from the data sets, it often requires quite a lot of context to understand. You know, just if if only you know which columns are disclosive and what are these things actually talking about. You know, a date is great if it's in a standardised ISA eight six zero one format, but it doesn't tell you the, the the function of that date. Right, that's the that's the point of an architect who needs to come in and prep the data for use. And similarly, if you're talking about metadata, and I very much enjoyed your mention of the fair principles at the beginning, words to live by, then. Um, Metadata extraction is more of an art than a science because it is about having the context and, the, and an SME, the SME knowledge to be able to, to pull out the right metadata and make it descriptive in the right way. So it's filling this gap between the kind of the, uh, the very deterministic tooling, if you like, which is just here is the structure of this data set expressed as a table. Here is the, the metadata from the column headings to this is what that means. And this is how you can populate your catalog. This is how you can populate your, populate your enterprise data model and start to see connections. So it's all stuff that is, it's one of the things um, I'm trying to do at ONS is, as I've done elsewhere, is develop a, a an enterprise data catalog, which is which is solely programmatically updated, right? Because I, I get quite tired of manual data catalogs. Um, and my architects often look at me and go, it's, you can't do that because we don't, the data doesn't come in the right format, it doesn't live in the right thing, and we have to spend lots of time prepping it to get it to go in there. So there's no there's no algorithm you can you can do to connect these things up. So this is what, and I was like, oh no, it's fine. We found a magic robot that can do it. So um, we're going to try and hook it up to a black box. Um, this is the this is the thing that I don't think it will get us all the way there. But if it's if it's a force multiplier, architects, data architects, data engineers are scarce skills, uh, and it's hard to get them into the civil service. It's hard to. It's not very hard to retain them. But it's quite hard to recruit them in the first place. And so, anything we can do to to act as a force multiplier is, is very welcome. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. So, speed, you're looking to speed up work. Your people tooling to get them. Uh, over the time, obviously, in, uh, I, I have a software engineering background. And in software engineering, we're seeing things like GitHub Copilot. There's something that we've rolled out within ScottLogic, something we, we we expect our our people to be using. Because why not have something that's going to help you to write your code a bit faster, or quite a lot faster? Um, but you mentioned that that's kind of sense of domain expertise. You can't just let the computer write the code because it could come up with some really funky stuff. This is a really good example, though, Copilot, right? Because I think that's the we talk about we often talk about human in the loop from a safety perspective, and that's obviously really important. But I think that human in the loop from an expertise uh, perspective is equally important. I play with Copilot, and I am no kind of coder, right? And I could see that some choices it made were better than others. So it's a it's it's something to speed up somebody who's already competent rather than somebody who or help people upskill, but rather than some, something that's going to replace those skills in the first place. 
And Jazz, in, uh, you work obviously in data science, analysis, engineering. Um, do you see a sort of a sort of a similar kind of take to to, to Charles and I on on the kind of incorporation of some of these agents to to help us do our do our work better, faster, um, at great, greater scale? Is that something you you see in your work too? Yeah, definitely. I think in that capability end as well, it's massive because you know you get a piece of code that you're you found on Stack Overflow. And it's it's poorly annotated, or you don't quite understand it because it's an unfamiliar domain. You can just chuck it into ChatGPT and ask it to explain it to you, and it saves you sitting through there picking through it line by line and figuring out what's happening, you know. And I think there's there's the other elements of it speeding up your work, but it's also improving the efficiency of your code. So especially with code pilot, you, you can end up with very very clean code that's very very efficient, and that's hugely beneficial for the amount of CO2 we're generating by the processes that we're doing. And so I think there's some great elements in there to improve the efficiency of the code we're writing and the efficiency of our work. But again, to, to that capability, you've got to know what you're doing to use it. So I think there's an element where people still need to be aware what their, their knowledge zone is and what their domain knowledge is for that kind of use of it, data science tools to understand how they're working and what's working under the hood, to be aware of, of how to adapt it and make sure it's doing exactly what you want it to do and that you understand how it's working. So I don't think it's going to replace us. I think it's just speeding us up along the way. But is there a potential sort of double-edged sword here where, where it's speeding us up in terms of the how quickly we can get up to speed and be effective doing something, but perhaps it's shortcutting us to um to a level of um agency and ability to do things that's perhaps not um you know commensurate to our to our domain knowledge is there a risk here that we that the tooling push, pulls us ahead really fast and we, and we perhaps um uh, are able to upskill people faster than they can learn the domain i think there there is i think if people are, are using something like copilot that's just making it for you whereas i think that capability to have it understood and explained to you is if you put it into chat GPT, I think helps build that domain knowledge quicker. So I think we're gonna find people expanding in their knowledge base a lot faster and their understanding than they would have otherwise because they, you know, they would have to dig around, read multiple sources, but it, it does come with risks because it's not always right. Um, and, you know, I think if you, again, you've got to understand the outputs of what's coming out of some of that chat GPT enough to understand if it's told you something stupid. And so there, there is definitely a risk there where it can't people be anyone's single source of, of L&D to understand code. So I think there's a, a common sense element in there. And I think that risk's always been there for jobs, right? People doing something outside their comfort zone. So I don't think that's a new risk, but I think it's a risk that might expand. I guess it's just a sense, as Charles said, if there's a force multiplier, if um... Yeah. If you can have 10x the impact with the help of tooling, then perhaps it's 10x the, the blast radius of um, yeah, an individual who's perhaps making a mistake. Perhaps the, it's easier to make bigger mistakes faster um, at greater scale is, is one kind of risk that, that people might raise around this kind of tooling. And I think that brings us on to the question of like, to, to what extent is this tooling going to support us perhaps to enforce some of the best practice and guardrails and, um, that we would want to have in our pipelines is that something that you that you've thought about in terms of um yeah so data engineering analysis pipelines is that is that to charles or myself sorry. oh it's to you jess sorry okay sorry um i think i think the guardrails have to be there for qa qc and i think it i think it's being aware if people have used gen ai in the generation of their work is really important for anyone that's qaing it um, we don't use it for, for the building of our, our tools. We just use it to check things out and understand things in the build process because of that sensitivity and the privacy elements of, of what you put in chat GPT, for example. You haven't got control of, of, of where your searches are going. But with that awareness and with that familiarity that's going to grow in teams, that QA is going to, you know, people QAing are going to become aware of, of the kind of errors that you're getting out of chat GPT that you're not getting out of, of of a human doing it you know there's there's a common thing when you you're trying to look at 
you know parameters where it, it, it shifts things a little or it, it, it adapts things in in a different pattern to the types of errors humans make and I think I think that openness about how you use it is is very important. That's a really interesting point that you make there though around um, the the nature of the errors that are made so we're not getting it's not a human who makes more errors or the, the kind of hallucinations or issues that Gen AI might have don't look like the kind of errors that a human would make. Um, a little bit about I play I play chess and like if you're playing against a computer at chess, computers quite often make unhuman like moves um, while they're beating you because they always beat you. Um, but um, I, so I wonder then like what what that kind of means in terms of, of risk. Is there a risk actually that's very hard sometimes to tell when there's an error because we're just not familiar with those sorts of errors? Is that something we're going to have to pay attention to? Again to you, Jess. I don't think it's a new risk, right? Because you get that when you get a new teammate as well, because different people make different types of errors. And if you get familiar, you know, with your your pair peer review of code of of your teammate, you know what to look for. You know the kind of things that they make mistakes they make. But it's understanding if there's these other errors to look out for. And they're quite characteristic. You know, it has it has a look to it, it has a feel to it, it has a, an error code to it. So I think with implementation, I think there's just got to be an awareness and a if, if you put it into processes to tell people what to look for, then, then documentation on training on what kind of errors to look out for would be really valuable, especially in a large organization. It's really interesting that you were, were talking about here then about um, LLMs, large language models, to unpack that. I don't think we've done that in this talk, but LLMs as being uh, almost like humans you know, um, fallible and, and sort of prone to error in the same way the human would be, although the errors might look different rather than looking at them as, any, as as actually a core part of the deterministic computer systems that we're used to. Is this, is, is this a new class? I'm going to put this to Charles, actually. Is this like a new class of uh, of computer system that, that we're dealing with here? I think, um, I mean, I, I think Jasmine makes a really good point, right? It's it's like having, because of the, the kind of... The speed and and uh, confidence with which it presents hallucinations sometimes it's exactly like having a new coworker you haven't yet worked out how to get through their uh, persona, um, and so you're starting to, to do new issues. I think that there's a there's a fluency thing, right? There's a, it, this is how it feels like a, a slightly different thing to the the normal deterministic uh, interactions of working with tooling, for instance, where you know this is going to happen, and I think. It might be a psychological thing as much in that you're, you're hardwired not to think in the same way about something that is talking to you as something that's just, you know, uh, moving things into cells in a in a table. So I, I don't know that, I don't think that we've necessarily got the cognitive tools yet to, to understand how we will fit this into our workplace properly. And that's why I'm quite cautious about how we, you know, uh, I mean, it's a classic data architecture thing, right? What do you want to do with this? Oh, I want to do, I want to use it to do more data modeling and more metadata management, more and better metadata management. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's a, not a step change in the approach. But I do think that it is. My wariness is less about the, you know, what's are we all going to get sent into paper clips or anything, but more that are we going to kind of we are we going to make unusual mistakes that are quite hard hitting? You know, the data sets that my teams deal with. Are pretty important and pretty sensitive the outputs that, that they enable are pretty important and so the last thing you want to do if we were talking about something you know a new modeling tool we would spend months and years evaluating it comparing it to existing ones and then and going forward so that's in a sense it's, it's trying to it's trying to work sensibly within the hype cycle and make sure that you're not rushing to to productionize something that whether it's ready or you're not whether it's not ready or you're not ready something's not quite right so there's a there's quite a long way to go and there's also there's also a natural you get again talking about the kind of data that my teams work with there is a natural uh cautiousness about anything which is a black box right so as much as we say listen it's stateless i am not concerned about the data being pulled into the the models to somebody who isn't uh a techie that just sounds like words, right? Yeah, sure. But it's a, it's a magic robot in a box. How do you know what it's doing with the data? Um, so until we've got, and we, we weren't even there with kind of classical, with classical data approaches with ethics and transparency and things like that, you know, to go, and now we're introducing this whole new thing, which nobody really understands why it gives the answer it does, but they're just really good. So we're gonna use it. Um, 
and, and to, to unpack that a little bit, the, 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 nobody knows how it gets the answer, and it's a black box. But to your point earlier, this isn't something that you're running inside your own data center or your own virtual private mm. cloud. This is something that you're that is being run by a mega corporation the other side of the Atlantic, um, and you're trusting the terms and conditions uh, for what they're doing on that data. So, does it mean that for your likes of ONS and uh, obviously the work Jazz is doing in places like health security, you're dealing with very, very sensitive data. Does it put even more onus on the development of tools around things like differential privacy um, that, that perhaps have always been a kind of a little bit of a pipe dream, but it was always on on our premises, so it was kind of always okay. Is that is that suddenly um, sort of up in the list of things that you want to start tackling? I don't. I think it would have to yeah, become I mean, incredibly sure. useful. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you get it. I was talking for ages. I, I think it would have to become a lot more useful to be worth the, the cost of putting those elements in place. Because I think using it to say, you know, I've got this error and, and how do I mitigate it? Um, that's handy, right? And you, and you don't need that differential privacy for it to speed up work and, and knowledge and, and save hunting around for, for causes of errors. But it's it's hugely costly to set up these things. And with it being a black box that you don't know how it works. And until we can really get to that point of being able to sort of edit those transformers in an efficient known way to change knowledge nodes within it, it's gonna be a huge investment that could then break because we don't know how to maintain and fix it. So I think there's a long way to go before it's, it's worth integrating into a, a continuous pipeline within an organization. And, and that's partly, so there's a, there's a cost thing there. Um, it's off-premise. There's also just like a scale of it. Um, um, yes, yeah, scale of expense and complexity around, um, around making that kind of level of integration. But um, were these technologies at a point that you were able to give them enormous corpuses of, of data and get extremely accurate and high quality insights out um doesn't that put the onus on um data strategists to be able to say okay here's a path to us to us achieving that this is how we'll, we'll, we'll be able to price that is that something um i guess charles it might be more like in, in your areas uh, as, as an architect responsible for that, that infrastructure study is that something that you kind of see emerging as, a, as an ask to you in your in your role absolutely i think you know you you I was nodding furiously as Jazz was speaking now, and I was thinking, and the other side of it is cost, right? We don't know how it works. We don't know how reliable it is, but also I don't know how much it's going to cost, not just from a, this is how much it, an individual piece of compute costs, but also it is being, because of the cost of development, uh, we're in a slightly unfortunate situation where it's a loss leader at the moment, right? Chat GPT, the free interface is a loss leader. So what is open API, open API going to charge for it in the future it's not like google's gcp pricing where i can say which is you know relatively difficult to uh, as with all the cloud providers quite difficult to understand how that's going to fit together at the moment we don't know what it's going to look like as a cost in the future but it's also the um and i think to, to your, your point more generally thinking about the infrastructure that's going to require it's a, a sort of mixture of your point and Jazz's point, which is that we don't know because of the, I, I, the thing that worries me about it is that I, I don't really have a mental model for how I start to, to start to calculate total cost of ownership. Right? I don't have a, what's it going to look like to run something? If I if I ran something like this within my private cloud, what's that going to look like? If I run something like this on prem, which you know, uh, hilarious uh, idea in the first place, what would that look like? Um, how do we, at the end of the day one of the things about sensitive data is you can always retreat to well i can just pull down the you know pull down the drawbridge right or or, or uh, pull up the pull down the blind and nobody can get get to it and the, the concern would always be that you're almost certainly going to be using a third party tool here which has got incredibly fast incredibly uh detailed access to the data and you're never going to be able to fully close that off if you want to carry on using it in a productionized way so you the the bottom line with a governance strategy is well i can always pull the cable out right uh, and we'd still be able to work we'd still be able to produce stuff and it would take some of that it would it would concern me that that, that would disappear as an option um and we'd have to yeah. well, we ever do pull the cable out right but it's a it's a psychological security blanket 
but we already can't pull the cable out of some of the things that we that we use every day. For example, um, yes, yeah, so the Microsoft stack um, is something that is just ubiquitous across um, organizations worldwide. And of course, there are examples of people don't use the Microsoft stack, but almost everywhere you go, uh, people are using it. So there's a, there's a sense that at some point, people overcome that that governance risk. Um, with the cloud, um, we went on the journey over the past 10 years. Um, and this is coming from a public sector perspective, but I know in an industry perspective as well, not everywhere has overcome the idea that there's this shared responsibility model and AWS or GCP or Azure take you up to this level and, and they, they look after it from there down. They're doing everything, running the database, running the server, running every whatever, whatever. but there's a model by which they don't have access directly to your data or whatever. Is there there's some kind of pattern of shared responsibility model that, that works for Gen AI systems? This is very deeply integrating the data into very black box processes. This isn't like running a database for you. But I, I do wonder whether the value ends up being great enough that you know, you know, governance um, it ends up being saying yes, because you, you know, the, the, the prize is big enough. Is that something that, I mean, it's too soon to say perhaps, but is that something that you, you guess is a, is, is a point at some point in the future? And to Charles, please. I think um, from an in infrastructure perspective, I do, I take your point, but there's, it, you're going to have to see uh, a real shift in the level of return. Because at the moment, if you said, actually, we can now automate the ingestion of a lot of the operational data we pull in from other departments, from, from commercial organizations, you could turn that into a process that takes seconds as opposed to days. And therefore, we could get to you know, real-time stats because of the ability to pull in data, run our processes, and have them have them open. That would become a very compelling proposition, but we're not there yet, you know. And and people have promised that before, and I've been I've been disappointed before, you know, in terms of oh, we can really speed this up. It never. There's always something, you know, and it might just be that actually, for very good reasons, data governance at certain points stops that kind of real time flow, and you know, and we don't want to change that. So, again. It, there are a lot of imponderables in the equation, if you like, in trying to work out what the what the return would look like. Um, it feels it feels unlikely at the moment, but um, but it doesn't feel. Again, it's like I, I see this more as a as a step change rather than a rather than a kind of revolution. It's it's we will get fast. We will get closer to uh, near real time. Let's say I'll, I'll be I'll be tremendously ambitious and say near real time processing. Um, which we're nowhere near at the moment. So, so you know, you could see it making a huge impact and thus having a, a return, but it's not quite the same as. I think it would have to be transformational to be to be worth some of the costs that are being bandied around. So there's again a bit of a remains a remains to be seen, and Jazz, I think it's very much in line with with the point you you were making earlier. So going back a little bit to, um, we're talking about. Um, People and, and skills. One of the things that I that I've seen from from clients of ours is this question of what does my workforce of the future need to to look like? What what, what will I anticipate in terms of my um, you know, even twenty four twenty five? Who should I be recruiting? What should my grad program look like? Those sorts of things. Jazz, is that something that you've um, put very much thought to? Yeah, I've been thinking about the impact of this on the future workforce. I think when it came out, we thought it, you know people were saying it was going to replace that that junior level roles and so that we wouldn't have many junior level and we'd have sort of a, a top team that reviews it and we'd have get rid of all of these people in between. I don't really see that coming now I've, I've used the tools. Um, my view is it's going to accelerate people up in their capability, but what we're probably at risk for is more of a burnout. I think one of the things you know we've talked about before in the past is a lot of your job is quite cognitive and quite hard, but as a, a data architect or a data scientist, a lot of your time is also spent twiddling around, moving little boxes around on a screen and, and getting them all nicely lined up and making arrows drawing between places or, you know, as a data scientist, setting up workshop slides to, 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 to capture people's knowledge and, and, and map things. And those tasks are quite relaxing. And they're the ones that we really can do now with Gen AI that can take, you know, a few seconds to set up the draft for that, that you can just edit and move around. And I think 
with it taking that downtime out, we've got to think about what that does to our workforce and workforce well-being because, you know, we're going to be using our brains all the time or a lot more, um, you know, to get this 17 or 20 percent increase in efficiency that people are targeting around implementing Gen AI into the workforce. But what does that mean? How tired are going to, people going to be when they go home at the end of the day if they've been working on, you know, max cognitive power all day rather than relaxing around with boxes? And I'm going we to miss that. About, we were yeah. talking about this before. You were talking about a colleague who uh, is a neuroscientist who got to spend like a day listening to an audio book once in a while, just putting dots on neurons in, in up to a picture of the brain. Uh, that's the sort of work that now just immediately gets done in a second by by a computer and you don't get to listen to your audio book for a day and do your job anymore that sort of thing yeah or like yeah setting up your training data i mean there's there's lots of times when you used to get a bit of a bit of stuff and 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 fiddle around for a while you know for especially for junior data scientists but even even a senior data architect or or anyone you spend a lot of time moving boxes around and that's the bit that's that's almost gone already um that that time you need to set that up but that's you know, so it's not a seventeen percent increase. You talk about it's not actually not having juniors. It's just that actually the sort of the, some of the scope of the job changes because mm -hmm. sort of slices of yeah, setting up your workshop slides or your test data or whatever just becomes much much faster. Ask the machine for that done, and then you're actually you're you've still got the whole stack of seniority. It's just that everyone's using all of those tools for all of those parts of the job, and you're then focused much more on the unique deeper more involved cognitive part of your of your work mm -hmm. as a professional you say that puts a yeah higher cognitive load on it on a, on a daily basis on the on the team so while you might be more productive especially that productivity comes at the, at the cost of ramping up um the amount of individual effort like the actual amount of um challenge in the work for the individuals in the workforce yeah really interesting charles is that something you that you recognize as well you know what? I'd never, I'd never thought about it like that, and I, I do find it. I'm an architect, right? So I, I draw clouds a lot. That's basically what my downtime is. It's uh, uh, clouds and, and arrows, as Jazz says. It's, um, I think it's. A, the, there are a couple of things that sprung out to me. One is that, you know, it, it's quite. It's always struck me is it's quite hard to get the seniors, the domain experts, if they haven't worked their way up and got experience as more in more junior roles to get that context. And one of the things I worry about is that any kind of architect needs business context to be designing the right thing right and and that goes that goes double for data architects where you need to understand what is this going how has this been used what do the source systems look like what do the source systems do so that you can understand what the questions you can ask of the data or present the data in such a way that it can be questioned intelligently and what there is a, a worry to me that some of that what seems like not productive work that the architects are doing is investigating the domain understanding what the thing is and, and doing that kind of necessary framework mental framework building to be able to create a design and I, I am i am quite concerned that we will lose that simply because you can ask the machine it says oh it's this yeah and therefore there's no reason for you to build that scaffolding about the shape of the domain that you're you're interested in so i, I think um the the burnout point is a really good one i think the the inability to get the kind of soft skills you need if you like the the contextual under contextual understanding to be able to do it is another worry i have so there is a again it's the it's 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 i'm less concerned about as i said earlier i'm less concerned about the we're all getting turned into paper clips and more that these are actually quite radical shifts in how we approach work and and you know uh, capacity building and we're not thinking about that we're thinking about oh will this speed everything up such a yeah that's again it builds really interesting on the, on the perspective when we look to more broadly to the to the wider organization outside of our, our areas of, of, of expertise and specialism obviously we work with stakeholders across organizations um who depend on us for our work um but collaborate with us too um to what extent do does this a collaborative process or the, the tooling available to our non specialist uh, non-data specialist stakeholders what how might that change change the picture do, you, do we see kind of more um power in the hands of some of our stakeholders users or the relationship that we have to our stakeholders in the organization evolving um to you charles it's a really good question actually and i think it it will depend i think i'm, I'm curious to know if we will still be using a chat interface to, uh, to 
to um, in a year's time, right? If it's still something that people go and do, and I have directors who say, "Oh, well, I asked ChatGPT this, and uh, uh, it did this." But I had my divisional away day yesterday, and we were uh, people were doing pitches for various things, and the amount of ChatGPT generated raps about data that were uh, thrown about in the chat was extraordinary. So it's obviously changing some dynamics, but I think the 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 not concern actually it's, it's probably a good thing like i'm starting to have situations where where senior people who didn't have time to get into the technical details of stuff will use chat gpt to be able to ask a question about you know what is metadata which is always a handy one for me not to have to answer um or what do they mean enterprise data model and i'm starting to find that that is trickling in and that's great you know from from my perspective the the, the ability to give a kind of chat interface to knowledge is is fantastic right because i think that thoughtful people are using it to to bootstrap conversations if you like um flip side of that is there's a danger that you know um you get away with blagging a lot more but um i guess we'll just have to cope with that i think that's uh, i think it's ever been thus hasn't it i think it's <laughs> in terms of in terms of uh, um how people people work so we've got about 20 minutes left, maybe 15 minutes uh, left to, to talk. So I, what I wanted to do was kind of reflect on some of the, the things we've, we've, we've spoken about there. We've spoken a bit about you know, changes to the, to the wider business. We're a lot about changes to our own skills and about some of the, the risks from things like data privacy and, and the fact that these are black boxes of cost. Um, and in fact, we almost touched on there with Jazz. I think you were making the point um, that there's a potential environmental uh, knock-on impact for this because we're talking about using vast quantities of computers um, to do, you know, making a cup of tea type level of uh, <laughs> of detail work for us when we're just ramping up whole data centers versus worth of compute to do these 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 kind of things for us. So, of all of those things, back down to earth as a data leader in the end of 2023, the year of AI sort of hit the mainstream. Um, what will you be doing in, in, in 2024? I think to you, Jazz, what are the things that you'd expect to be doing with your team in 2024 to, I suppose, answer some of the un unanswered questions or um, uh, or take advantage of, of the tooling? What, what, what's your kind of maybe top top three things on your list of uh, places to go with Gen AI in the next year? I think the ability to edit it is going to be the, the critical element to go in to find those knowledge nodes and selectively edit and update it. You know, we, we talked earlier about the, the huge cost if you bring it in, build an LLM specific to something like ONS. But then if you want to get rid of that old data or how do you how do you change the weighting on the data so that you, you're more biased by recent data and ignore old data, all these nuances, I think, within it to make sure that it's actually producing quality aspects that are maintainable, I think are going to be the things that we're, we're focusing on in the future uh, within the field as a whole i think i think for me i'm just going to be focusing on finding those things where it speeds up the processes like you know generating um a template for a, a, a user flow through a dashboard in, in a few seconds rather than 20 minutes you know i think we're just going to find more and more little bits of our job that where it fits in and speeds things up but for us we're going to be keeping a really close eye on the the ethics the transparency the privacy and the quality of anything that we we use. So I, I can't see us implementing it into automating anything. So I'm just being little tricks to help us along the way for a while yet. Yeah, it's going to be sort of safe, sort of safe to fail experiments, I guess, is how I'd characterize that in my, my mind's eye. And Charles, the same question to you, what, what are sort of, say, the top three things that you'll, that you'll be taking forward into the next year? I completely agree with Jazz and, and that kind of the, the cautious experimentation, I think, is the first one, but also being being um, trying to make sure we're, we are getting all the variables in. I mean, you make it you make a good point about the amount of compute you would, you would use to do something that would take a human three minutes, making a cup of tea or drawing a cloud. Right. Is this really a good use of resource? And I think we don't have we've got some calculations, the ability to do some of those calculations. But we don't really have a framework to bring everything together and start really thinking about total cost of ownership um, and what this really means. And I think that will change the narrative if we start to put something together. But I think we're being really clear. Uh, we're doing we've we already uh, does a huge amount of work about data ethics and about transparency. We want to make sure that we are we are doing that first. You know, the 
the nice thing about being a public servant right is you can you can do it right you're expected to do it right so start with the start with the guidelines and, and and then do the shiny stuff afterwards rather than the other way around so um but the other thing is is I, i'd like to see i'd like i'd like us to see if there are some ways we can use it in production you know in a cautious limited way is there a way that we can say look you know this can this can help us uh empower an expert to deliver a data model in a day rather than a week or you know or, or help data flow at at much faster speeds um we will start off with open data we'll t- we'll start off with with non risky data um and start to prove it out the other thing is i'm really i have i have long been incredibly incredibly uh uh s- skeptical about synthetic data right i mean i just it's it's the holy grail where you can go you can't tell anything about it but you do get the same statistical output so i don't see how that could be possible right and you're starting to get to a stage where i have seen some some demos using chat gpc where there is a you can in relatively limited environments generate something that's synthetic and therefore privacy enhancing but does start to give you the kind of outputs you want or enough to be able to run some basic basic analysis on it so Again, there's some exciting stuff that maybe wasn't possible before that we might start to see awaiting. Yeah, super. I've got a question from the chat that I wanted to, to go. It's been part for a little while. So thanks so much for asking. It was about 25 minutes ago, but we were, we were in, in the flow. But it's a really um, uh, absolute one, I think, for what you were just saying there, which is something to touch on some of the processes that could perhaps be automated within the public sector using AI. Um, so look, the, the question is, what sort of processes do you feel could be automated. I'll put it to you first, Charles, within the public sector using AI. Um, and how do you think it, the, this is best evaluated, the, the, the kind of processes that could be automated? Let me be let me be that kind of awful person who says, I, I can, let me answer with what we won't automate, or what I don't think should be automated. You know, they, And it is that kind of human interface, right? If you've got a call center of people, uh, a call center who's dealing with benefit stuff or health stuff, that is the thing where these are, very expensive to maintain, run and maintain. And the temptation is always, oh, well, if we replace them with the magic robot, maybe that would save us a bunch of money. And I think that actually some of those ethical frameworks are going to be really important to say, no, actually for for most sensitive interactions, this is not an appropriate, uh, not an appropriate use. And actually the trouble is most of government's interactions with systems are, are um, uh, sensitive, right? You know, you don't interact with, with um, with government to uh do my i don't know obviously there are some things you can get a fishing rod that's probably less uh less sensitive but most of the things you do are going to be at at times of pain or stress in your life and so we have to be really careful with that but equally there's quite a lot of stuff that is is difficult because of legacy you know we've got this whole kind of uh robotic process uh uh, industry where we are effectively talking about ways to get data out of one legacy system and into another. That's the kind of thing where if you were confident about uh, confident about the uh, the context and the, the ability of it to move, and you had a human in the loop, that you could really speed things up. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But I think when we think down, uh, so for end to end transactions like fully automating things with AI is almost like let's not talk about that but within those uh workflows so I've worked quite, quite a lot in government looking at different kinds of workflows a lot of the time there'll be some case notes or a lot of case notes so a lot of information that could be summarized into a, a to, into a team it feels to me like just to give I suppose to kind of chip in with some of my own answer to, to that uh, process automation it feels initially short term there are actually probably quite a lot of opportunities for and with a human in the loop, that human to have stuff summarized for them or simplified for them or or, or um, by, by a system where they've got eyes on and they can check, sanity check it. And it will be in you know, non, uh, non-critical non areas. So, you know, for example, yeah, you know, case notes for for a given case within within a process where there are guardrails around it. So to, to, to answer that question. Jazz, there's one here that I, that I that I think might be a good question um for you to pick up. And I don't want to stop you from coming on the previous questions. I do kind of go back there if you like, but um there's a question here, how would you monitor the development and implementation of AI models in your area? I know it's something like LDK have looked at um just from 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 talking to to yourself. Um yeah, and how would we... you measure the efficiency or success of um uh, 
of those models. So I think when you're looking at, at, at building them, so when you're developing them, you know, there's, there's great frameworks and different organizations adhere to different ones. So as, as Elderco will work to whatever framework people are using, but we also have our own internal framework of, of things we check to make sure, you know, that it's safe, that it's transparent, that it's doing what it can do and that it's, it, it is, you know, causing no harm in its build. But then I think the other element is that maintenance and making sure it's still doing what you intended it to do over time. So we use an AI safety check that we made that looks across all of AI safety and, and ethics and assesses the risks associated with, with an AI and that can be done sort of periodically while it's deployment to, to check it is still doing what it's supposed to be, what maintenance needs to be done to make sure that it, it's still working as intended and is still as transparent and robust as it should be. And I think when you're thinking towards that success, I think you always have to have success metrics for any AI um, or any any tool or any intervention that you put put in place. You know, is it is it having the intended impact? And that comes back into sort of the domain owner space of what change am I wanting to make? Is this increasing efficiency? If it's in a, a process flow element, if it's making decisions about society, is it making fair and equitable decisions? Depending on the problem you have in space, I think just having those clear parameters and tracking those over time to make sure it's still doing what you intended to do past you're going through beta and going live is really important. And that, that lets you know when maybe you need a health check because it's no longer performing as expected. So I mean, you make a great point there that, that, that this, is, this isn't something that you sort of train a model up once and then deploy it. This isn't a thing you build and then it's done. And then it's just good that it goes and sits there doing its thing. Um, I won't, we won't go into the sort of technical question, questions around drift and the kind of way that these, mm -hmm. these systems drift over time. But there is, uh, these are operational systems. So these are like, you don't just hire a person and leave them in a cupboard doing the <laughs> thing. Yeah. It's, part, it's part of an ongoing process of, of um, treating this like work that could or, or at yeah, any time be slipping in terms of quality. And you need to continually put effort into to ensure that it's aligned. And that's a human process as well as something that you ha I guess have some degree of automation in, t in terms of me measuring those mm -hmm. metrics and seeing um, whether it's delivering the value that, that you expect at any given point. Yeah and I think this aligns with the GDS strategy you know on, on that that continuous maintenance and monitoring of, of any of the tools that we use and it's you know what what you need are those very very practical tooling like, like we use that enables you to actually do it rather than have a theory about it and it's like any any product or any service you're offering and AI is the same. It's, it's got risks and you just have to manage and monitor those risks continually while it's live. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm going to ask this question to you both. I'll start with Charles. Um, and actually this was a question that's come from the chat, but it was going to be my, one of the questions I asked at the end anyway, which is how do you manage stakeholders who get overly excited about the possibilities of AI? I guess like we've all, we're all working with, some people in our organizations at the moment. Obviously, Scott Logic, we're all very sober and pragmatic and down to earth. But sometimes we have those, our conversations can get a bit frothy, you know, get, get a bit like excited. How do we manage that? Because a lot of our conversation today has been about actually you know, tooling here, experiments there, let's play it there as it comes. Charles, is that something that, that, that you're dealing with at, at, at ONS? And, and how do you approach that kind of challenge? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just play it safe and say, of course not at ONS. Everyone's very sober and pragmatic. Um, the uh, Maybe in the wider government, you've got people, you've got enthusiasts. I think there's always a, a bit of a problem with any, with any new tech, right? Where someone says, oh, I've heard this thing, it's brilliant, it's going to change how we work. And if you are sober and pragmatic, you risk losing that person in terms of, oh, this person just doesn't see the potential. You know, they're just, it's just being Charles. He's, he's incredibly boring. So um, I will go somewhere else and do this. Um, you need to, you, you do need to manage um, that enthusiasm and put it in context. So I think one of the things that, um, you know, we've, we, we have conversations with stakeholders where we will go, we will range from, oh, maybe we should build our own, train our own LLM. And I, I get, you know, I, the blood drains from my face. Um, to, and I'm saying, well, maybe we could test it out using some tooling first and, and, and see how we could do it into workflows. And some of it is is trying to make what is or are effectively quite ca cautious, pragmatic steps into things that sound like you will get quite a so solid return on them and therefore can be. So there's a, 
there's a kind of pitching element to it, which is that you, you don't want to do the big flashy thing first. You want to do this thing, but this is why this thing is also cool. Um, and I think there is a there is a tendency among us technologists. Um, well, maybe it's just me. I certainly have a tendency as a technologist to kind of roll, do the eye roll, right? Oh, I see that some sea level person has read an article and now understands everything about this and it's going to bring it into a meeting. And I think that's unhelpful. And I think the unhelpfulness comes from us if we're not engaged. I mean, that enthusiasm to improve things should be harnessed and and, and uh, made use of, not kind of scoffed at. And, you know, so I think it's a, it's a careful balancing act. Um, it's a really boring answer, isn't it? It should have been, that's just tell them no. I think so. I'm... <laughs> So I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is sort of lean into the enthusiasm, and that's it, it resonates so much with with myself. I'm you never want to pour cold water on the enthusiasm of someone in whatever organisation to get the job done better, to do the job better for people, for the organisation, for the work. Like you don't want to be the person saying no, you can't have nice shiny things. Um, there was one more question, but actually, Jazz, I want to put the same question to you, but maybe just what if they won't listen to the risks so if you come across sort of cross situations where you're i mean you've worked in some very sensitive areas i suppose very risk aware areas like how do you sell um the the the, the risks of it this whilst perhaps trying to lean into the enthusiasm so we we're always really clear any ai that we use comes to a certain estimates and we spend a lot of time and, and, and we work with universities to get guidance as well on on how to communicate those risks through to an end user so i think you know it's up to an end user what level of of risk they're comfortable with or level of certainty that's that's not my domain you know but if they let me know their level of certainty i can let them know if, if it can be done either i'd always rather use statistics um ai you know the most explainable thing first not opposed to ai love ai but you've got to um you know, do the most explainable thing and the, the most efficient thing you can use. But regardless of, of whether it's statistics or AI, the outcome needs to be have those certainty estimates so that the user can have the right level of trust in the insight that's provided rather than a binary decision. And, and that's why so interesting that in there you're talking about. So the risks are actually negotiated on the basis of risk appetite, right? And having that open yeah. conversation about, well, what is OK to go wrong? I have to, mm -hmm. I have to work with engineering, operational engineers. Like, how much downtime is okay? Do you want eight minutes once a month, or do you want like one block per year of an hour? Like, there's different, like yeah. different things people want. So, if you have that conversation, that sets you up to, to succeed. Okay, yeah, I'm no we've, got one, we've got one minute left. We have a question from Joe Carstairs in, in the chat, um, which I'm going to ask you basically as a yes or no. I'm going to phrase it into a yes or no, <laughs> yes or no answer. It, um, Joe's saying, if I'm following, the main potential for Gen AI is explaining things to speed up upskilling and carrying out repetitive tasks. So, like, it's going to speed up stuff and do repetitive, manage stuff away from us. But we already have humans for explaining things and algorithms for carrying out repetitive tasks. Is it really a game changer? So, <laughs> so just unpack that a little bit. So, we've got algorithms for 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 carrying out repetitive tasks. We can write algorithms to do stuff. We've got humans for explaining things. What is it that Gen AI, Gen AI is doing that we didn't have before it? Um, Charles, I'll put that on you first. I think uh, it's it's not a game changer. Is, is if, if if by that you mean are we effectively changing the, the whole game? It's moving to a completely different paradigm. It is a game changer if you if you're thinking about that the the benefit of this is less that it does what a human can do, but it does what a human can do so much faster right you you can have that summary done is that I, I i do not think that a summary of a policy document generated by genoa is better than one generated by a policy expert who's got 20 years of experience and understands all the nuance i do know that it will take a second and a half versus two weeks and sometimes that trade-off is 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 going to be one you're you're willing to make so i think that it's a it's the answer would be no I guess, in the sense that what we're really talking about is is along the lines of robotic process automation, rather than this is a completely new way of working. But yes, in the sense that we can free up. I think there's a there's a there's a positive thing, right? If you look at uh, Charles, you're out. Really made... oh, it's done. There you go. Jazz, you get you get you. Sorry, you've got you've got maybe 20, 30 seconds, Jazz. So what, what do you I think about? How whether and how it's a game changer. Briefly. I think the way it's a game changer is that you don't have to make a specific tool 
to do each of those repetitive tasks that the the gateway to generating more tools that do boring laborious tasks or i find quite relaxing laborious tasks actually but um you know i think the assumption that they're always boring is a little unfair um but to do repetitive tasks is really quick to make a new tool, whereas it would have been quite costly to get a specific tool to do a specific thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I, my, my take on it is if you take that summarizing policy documents, um, the, the Gen AI can consume all of the policy documents the government's ever written and then make a response on it in 15 seconds or something, um, which is simply not possible for a human to do, even if it doesn't do it perfectly. And then maybe a human spends half an hour fact checking and, and you know and, 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 and editing it um, which would n never have been possible um, okay uh, thank you everybody uh, I hope that this has been interesting for those attending it's a bit of an insight into uh, into sort of two to um, your very senior leaders in, in data and how we're thinking about this and I hope there have been some takeaways that you can apply in your um, work going forward uh, get in touch with us at Scotlogic if you'd like to talk any more about um, doing things with generative AI and I thank uh, uh, Dr Jasmine Grimsley and uh, Charles Baird for joining us today thank you so much <laughs>